Uh, I've had several people comment tonight. They like my brand new shirt, which I just changed because with the heat, I thought it's going to be too hot in that tonight. But I'll put it back on before I leave because I'll catch cold otherwise. Uh, but uh, once I discovered the word eclectic, I actually felt like I fit in humanity. It's like I had a space, you know, because I was the kid that wore cowboy boots and jeans and a t-shirt every day to school, right? And I had friends in every group, every group. And, uh, and I was one of those people that tried to pull them out of their groups, right? Uh, a little claim to fame. Uh, I was a defensive back in football. And uh, back then, they... Uh, were beginning in the 70s, they were beginning to teach defensive backs to run backwards. And so in my cowboy boots, I could outrun most people backwards while they were running forwards because I ran everywhere. And so I'll never forget <laughs> my first youth group that I worked with when I was 28 years old. I had two guys that were runners, and I thought, this is going to be tough. But I lined us all up, and I took off, and they beat me by about that far. And they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe somebody could run that fast backwards. But uh, another reason for that is if you've got a lot of bullies that are after you, you learn to run. You know? And if you've got a mouth on you, you learn to run. So uh, it all worked to my advantage. <laughs> anyway. But uh, anyway... <laughs> I appreciate the prayers from last Wednesday night. I always appreciate your prayers. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I believe that God allows any sort of suffering is for His church to pray. Because in, what is it, uh, in Exodus, there's a spot there that says in the Holy of Holies, he, the prayers of the righteous resonate. And we, we have a tendency not to see that because we have a tendency to think that God doesn't hear us most of the time uh, because we don't see immediate results. But the reality is he's listening all the time and he knows what's best for us. <laughs> So even in what I'm going through, <laughs> he knows what's best for me. So we are going to do something a little unusual tonight. We need to get farther into Exodus because of last week. We kind of lost a week, a week or a chapter or two. And so, Brian, you're going to be second just in case. And you may have to pull up on your phone NLT. But the way I'm doing this is Wayne is going to read for us chapter 27, 28, 29, and possibly 30 of Exodus, which is going to be about 100 verses. And it takes roughly 20 minutes. But the reason I'm doing it this way, I will show you when we hit the end. Uh, and before I leave tonight, Cora and Vicki sent me a video explaining all of the parts of the uh, why the tabernacle was set up the way it was, uh, but especially when you get into Aaron, the priest, and the way he dresses, and the vestments that are on him, and what they're for, and what they do. And it is fascinating. It's a fascinating study. I've actually studied it before. But it's one of those things you almost, man, it's like a snail's pace when you go through it because everything matters. Everything means something. And, um, but to cover more ground, I'm going to give you homework if you want it. I'm going to 
send you this link to this video and or I'll get Vicky to do it. And uh, because uh, she sent it to me this morning and I listened to it for an hour. Now, he didn't talk for an hour. It's about 30 minutes long, 35 minutes. But I listened to it twice. I just stick it in my pocket, push play, go about my day, and I'm listening, listening, listening. Just fascinating stuff. And so when you, when you begin to enter into the things of God, especially in Exodus and then Leviticus, and then you fast forward that to Jesus, whole nother level of understanding who Jesus is. Whole nother level. Blows your mind. And it shows you the overall plan. And so when I see the plan, and I know there's problems, but God shows me there's purpose in the problems, then I'm in. Right? Uh, which is the, I call it the warrior ethos. Uh, once you see what the problem is, you're ready to execute the plan. Now you have purpose and everything you do matters, even if you die in it. And uh, so it matters. So uh, anyway, so I'm going to pray. And uh, I'm not going to tell you anything about Wayne. He's just going to start reading. I don't want any of you to turn and look at him when he starts reading. <laughs> but um, he's a lovely reader. Um, he's also a wonderful man and a man of God. So let's pray. And uh, we're going to start in chapter 27 because we've already done 26. Um, so 27, 28. And 29 and 30. So we'll read four chapters. Okay. So Father, in the holy name of Jesus, I thank you for the day. I thank you for trials and tribulations. Because that's where character is grown. Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer last night. And giving me some relief. I thank you for loving me and providing every detail of my life. I thank you for loving our church and providing every detail of our church's life. Father, I thank you for the individuals in this room, even though they're part of the church and or about to be part of the church. Praise the Lord. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will speak to the individual hearts here tonight and that you will use them for your glory. I just praise you and I thank you for your word because your word has life in it. And Jesus is the word. And when Jesus is in us, your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto the path. Thank you, Father. Bless the reading uh, as we go into this. In Jesus' name, amen. Go right ahead. Okay, Exodus 27. Using, ac using acacia wood, construct a square altar, seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet high. Make horns for each of its four corners so that the horns and altar are all one piece. Overlay the altar with bronze. Make ash buckets, shovels, basins, meat forks, and fire pans, all of bronze. Making a bronze grating for it and attach four bronze rings at its four corners. Install the grating halfway down the side of the altar under the ledge. For carrying the altar, make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with bronze. Insert the poles through the rings on two sides of the altar. The altar must be hollow, made from planks. Build it just as you were shown on the mountain. Then make the courtyard for the tabernacle, enclosed with curtains made of finely woven linen. On the south side, make the curtains 150 feet long. They will be held up by 20 posts set securely in 20 bronze bases. Hang the curtains with silver hooks and rings. 
Make the curtains the same on the north side, 150 feet of curtains held up by 20 posts, set securely in bronze bases. Hang the curtains with silver hooks and rings. The curtains on the west end of the courtyard will be 75 feet long, supported by 10 posts set into 10 paces. The east end of the courtyard, the front, will also be, 100, will also be 75 feet long. The courtyard entrance will be on the east end, flanked by two curtains. The curtain on the right side will be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. The curtain on the left side will also be 22 and a half feet long, supported by three posts set into three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, make a curtain that is 30 feet long. Make it from finely woven linen and decorate it with beautiful embroidery in blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Support it with four posts, each securely set in its own base. All the posts around the courtyard must have silver rings and hooks and bronze bases. So the entire courtyard will be 150 feet long and 70 feet wide, with curtain walls seven and a half feet high, made from finely woven linen. <coughs> Excuse me. The bases for the posts will be made of bronze. All the articles used in the rituals of the tabernacle, including all the tent pegs used to support the tabernacle and the courtyard curtains, must be made of bronze. Command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to keep the lamps burning continually. The lampstand will in the tabernacle in front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron and his sons must keep the lamp burning in the Lord's presence all night. This is a permanent law for the people of Israel, and it must be observed from generation to generation. Okay, hold on. So did you notice these measurements... Um, these are known in architectural terms as the perfect measurements for a, uh, uh, an oblong square. What do you call it? A rectangle. And uh, this, these in proportion are the same measurements in proportion as the, as the ark and as the ark that Noah was in. So it's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. I can't say this enough. Shipbuilders to this day use those measurements to build ships. And so why do we deny God the way that we do, yet we use his numbers? Yes, right? It's fascinating to me. Yeah, it then the other side of this is, did you notice once we get into the courtyard, uh, do you notice which end you enter in? The east end which is like the eastern gate, right? Uh, the sun rises in the east. Not only the S-U-N, but the S-O-N will, right? He will come from the east. When you see all of these things, and then you see, um, you, start, you start to see this series of symbolism. And then we get into every time an angel shows up, what color of garment do they wear? White, white linen. The uh, people in the uh, throne room of God, what do they wear? White linen. God has got this beautiful simplicity of this linen that is just white. And it's because, I believe it's because light starts as white in our eyes, but it's not really white. And there will be a day when we will see in another spectrum and we will see things the way they truly are. And a lot of the colors that I can't see, I will see. And a lot of the colors you can see, you'll see in a totally different light. Because light permeates everything. And in heaven, it permeates everything. Yes. Okay, Wayne, if you'll keep going. Okay, Exodus 28. Call for your brother, Aaron, and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Set them apart from the rest of the people of Israel so that they may minister to me and be my priests. Make sacred garments for Aaron that are glorious and beautiful. Instruct all the skilled craftsmen whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. Have them make garments for Aaron that would distinguish him as a priest set apart for my service. These are the garments that they are to make, a chest piece, an ephod, a robe, a patterned tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons to wear when they serve me as priests. So give them fine linen cloth, gold thread, and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. The craftsman must make the ephod of finely woven linen and skillfully embroider it with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. 
It will consist of two pieces, front and back, joined at the shoulders with two shoulder pieces. The decorative sash will be made of the same materials, finely woven linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the tribes of Israel. Six names will be on each stone arranged in the order of the births of the original sons of Israel. Engrave these names on the two stones in the same way a jeweler engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in settings of gold filigree. Fasten the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as a reminder that Aaron represents the people of Israel. Hmm. Aaron will carry these names on his shoulders (laughs) as a constant reminder whenever he goes before the Lord. Make the settings of gold filigree. Then braid two cords of pure gold and attach them to the filigree settings on the shoulders of the ephod. Then, with great skill and care, make a chess piece to be worn for seeking a decision from God. Make it to match the ephod using finely woven linen embroidered with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Make the chess piece of a single piece of cloth folded to form a pouch nine inches square. (coughs) Mount four rows of gemstones on it. The first row will contain, will contain a red carnelian, a pale green puridot, and an emerald. The second row will contain a turquoise, a blue lapis lazuli, and a white moonstone. The third row will contain an orange jacinth, an agate, and a purple amethyst. The fourth row will contain a blue-green beryl, an onyx, and a green jasper. All these stones will be set in gold filigree. And each stone will represent one of the twelve sons of Israel, and the name of that tribe will be engraved on it, engraved on it like a seal. To, a chat, to attach the chess piece on the ephod, make braided cords of pure gold thread. Then make two gold rings and attach them to the top corners of the chess piece. Tie the two gold cords to the two rings on the chess piece, and tie the other ends of the cords to the gold settings on the shoulder piece of the ephod. Then make two more gold rings and attach them to the inside edges of the chess piece next to the ephod. And make two more gold rings and attach them to the front of the ephod below the shoulder pieces and just above the knot where the decorative sash is fastened to the ephod. Then attach the bottom rings of the chess piece to the rings on the ephod with blue cords. This will hold the chess piece securely to the ephod above the decorative sash. In this way, Aaron will carry the names of the tribes of Israel on the sacred chess piece over his heart when he goes into the holy place. This will be a continual reminder that he represents the people when he comes before the Lord. Insert the Urim and Thummim into the sacred chess piece so they will be carried over Aaron's heart when he goes into the Lord's presence. In this way, Aaron will always carry over his heart the objects used to determine the Lord's will for his people whenever he goes in before the Lord. Okay, hold on. So, something I wanted you to notice, you know, we've all seen movies about royalty. We've all seen movies and documentaries on the ornateness that kings and queens dress and all of this. I don't know if you're visual like I am. If I hear, if I'm reading something, I don't, I'm an audible learner, so if I read something, I don't always pick it up. But when I listen to it, I pick it up. And I can begin to visualize. Do <clears throat> you notice <laughs> how ornate this is, yet how simple? It's threads and buttons and clasp and threads and rings. It's almost, to me, <laughs> when I begin to see the pictures of this represented. It's almost childlike. It's almost so simple that it's ridiculous in comparison to what we've seen in the movies and in the documentaries on royalty. Yet, I wanted to see if you picked up on this. We mostly, how do we say this, uh, by the time Jesus comes along and the Jews are hacked at him for claiming to be the son of God. They claim Moses as their father. Let me ask you a question. Who's actually representing them? Aaron. Aaron's representing them, not Moses. Now, it doesn't mean that Moses is not significant. If it weren't for Moses, there would be no exodus. 
But Moses had his own relationship with God. And he acts almost like an angel in comparison to Aaron. In fact, uh, how is it when uh, Moses and Aaron went into the court of Pharaoh and said, let my people go? God said, I will make you look like a god and Aaron is your spokesperson. So if that's true, then what is going on with the children of Israel not recognizing their true, the true sacrifice that is made by Aaron on their behalf? Everything he is wearing is something to remind him that he is representing the people. Yet how often, when's the last time you ever heard that? Which shows you how far off the Jews, by the time Jesus comes along, and the reason he's so hacked at them all the time. They're not teaching the true Exodus gospel. It's tainted. It's not, it's not even what it was supposed to be. So when, so when you begin to see that, you go, no wonder Jesus is upset with them half the time. Okay? Yes. Yeah, when in reality he's already done the work. Yes. And the good thing is, is on that day uh, when the Antichrist tries to sit in the temple and proclaim himself to be God, the scales will fall off their eyes and they will see Jesus for who he truly is. Which shows you that God blinded them for a period so we Gentiles could be grafted in. Which is crazy. Okay. Continue, Wayne. Make the robe that is worn with the ephod from a single piece of blue cloth, with an opening for Aaron's head in the middle of it. Reinforce the opening with a woven collar so it will not tear. Make pomegranates out of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and attach them to the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. The gold bells and pomegranates are to alternate all around the hem. Aaron will wear this robe whenever he ministers before the Lord, and the bells will tinkle as he goes in and out of the Lord's presence in the holy place. If he wears it, he will not die. (laughs) Next, make a medallion of pure gold and engrave it like a seal with these words, Holy to the Lord. Attach the medallion with a blue cord to the front of Aaron's turban, where it must remain. Aaron must wear it on his forehead so he may take on himself on himself any guilt of the people of Israel when they consecrate their sacred offerings. He must always wear it on his forehead so the Lord will accept the people. Weave Aaron's patterned tunic from fine linen cloth. Fashion the turban from this linen as well. Also make a sash and decorate it with colorful embroidery. For Aaron's sons make tunics, sashes, and special head coverings that are glorious and beautiful. Clothe your brother Aaron and his sons with these garments and then anoint and ordain them. Consecrate them so that they can serve as my priests. Also, make linen undergarments for them to be worn next to their bodies, reaching from their hips to their thighs. These must be worn whenever Aaron and his sons enter the tabernacle or approach the altar in the holy place to perform their priestly duties. Then they will not incur guilt and die. Hmm. This is a permanent law for Aaron and all his descendants after him. Carry on. Isn't that interesting? Just a little side note. You notice God created underwear? Just saying. He said, don't go up steps where people can see your nakedness. Why? So why is the tabernacle all on one level? Because he said not to go up steps. He doesn't want us to work our way and he doesn't want us to shame him in the process of our worship. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Okay, Wayne, keep going though. This is the ceremony you must follow when you consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Take a young bull and two rams with no defects. Then using choice wheat flour and no yeast, make loaves of bread, thin cakes mixed with olive oil and wafers spread with oil. Place them all in a single basket and present them at the entrance of the tabernacle along with the young bull and the two rams. Present Aaron and his sons at the entrance of the tabernacle and wash them with water. Dress Aaron in his priestly garments, the tunic, the robe worn with the ephod, the ephod itself, and the chest piece. Then wrap the decorative sash of the ephod around him. 
placed a turban on his head and fastened the sacred medallion to the turban, then anoint him by pouring the anointing oil over his head. Next, present his sons and dress them in their tunics. Wrap the sashes around the waist of Aaron and his sons and put their special head coverings on them. Then the right to the priesthood will be theirs by law forever. In this way, you will ordain Aaron and his sons. Bring the young bull to the entrance of the tabernacle where Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on its head. Then slaughter the bull in the Lord's presence at the entrance of the tabernacle. Put some of its blood on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour out the rest at the base of the altar. And take all the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat around them and burn it all on the altar. Then take the rest of the bull, including its hide, meat and dung and burn it outside the camp as a sin offering. Next, Aaron and his sons must lay their hands on the heads of one of the rams, then slaughter the ram and splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. Cut the ram into pieces and wash off the internal organs and the legs. Set them alongside the head and the other pieces of the body, then burn the entire animal on the altar. This is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. Hold on just a second. I noticed something by listening to Wayne Reed. I saw something I hadn't seen before. So when people say, I just only like this reader or I only like this, I find when I hear other people, then they read something differently than I do. They form their vowels differently, and next thing you know, you hear something, right? I never saw this before, but why can our bodies not go to heaven straight out? They're corrupted. It's it's corrupted. Now, our soul within our body, our soul within this tent is incorruptible once we give our heart to Jesus. But do you notice once they skin the animal, everything that goes in the animal, as in the whole filtration system, and if you've skinned an animal, you know what I'm talking about, the liver, the lungs, the the kidneys, the fat on all those things. All of those go outside the camp, along with its skin, along with its head, along with its dung, and it is burned as a sin offering. That's, right. That's why this body don't leave this earth. That's right. It can only leave as uh, if we're raptured or God pulls us up out of the grave. It can only leave because he purifies it. That's right. But we can't. We can't leave in and of ourselves. He says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, you'll return. Why? Believe it or not, the dirt cleanses our unrighteousness. We're all made of dirt, right? And God's pure dirt is pure. So because of the way he's reading that, I saw something I didn't see before, right? Isn't that fun? All right. Mm-hmm. And everything those are the only two witnesses that have never experienced the full death. Right. Like that. So does that mean that they because they ascended to heaven so and everything, but they never had the full death body like Well does that mean that they're let's just chase that rabbit a second. When they come back, that we assume that's Enoch and Elijah. Yeah, that's what because I mean. they're the only two that didn't physically die. Yeah, that's right. But right what now. happens to them once the devil has his way with them? They die. Yeah, they die. They right. die. And they're in the streets for three days. For three days, yeah. Which means they die like everybody else does. Right. But, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about right now, though. Yeah. Uh, she mentioned um, the two witnesses in Revelation. What about them not dying? So, um, the, I mean, we're, the, they're in heaven right now. They're in heaven right now. They're in heaven or they're in a place. They may not actually be in heaven. They may be in, they may still be in Abraham's bosom, which is where some other things take place. But I don't want to chase it too much. But the point is, everything must die. And even they die when they come back. So, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, tainted. And yeah. Yes, but 
but yes yes okay but but the reality is we can see God once we meet Jesus many of us have had visions right Moses saw God face to face David saw God on some levels through the Ark of the Covenant there's there's so many Samuel talked to God spoke to him out loud right Samuel unbelievable so they're still God can still speak it's yeah yeah no it's okay it's okay I don't mind chasing a rabbit all right where'd we go uh 15 19 I think. 19 okay here we go okay now take the other ram and have Aaron and his sons lay their hands on its head then slaughter it and apply some of its blood to the right earlobes of Aaron and his sons. <laughs> also put it on the thumbs of the right hands and the big toes of the right feet. Splatter the rest of the blood against all sides of the altar. Then take some of the blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his sons and on their garments. In this way, they and their garments will be set apart as holy. Okay, hold on just a second. I'm only addressing this because you see this a lot and it makes no sense to us. But in... Mosaic culture. When you made a vow or you made a promise to somebody, you put your right hand under their right thigh or you took their right shoe or you grabbed their right earlobe or you shook with your right hand. All of these right things have to do with clean and unclean. And so when you begin to see this series of things happening, that's what that's talking about. And so God is cleansing their right sides for a reason. Because clean, right, unclean, left. So it's just very interesting. Plus, do you know it was very rare for a Jew to be left-handed back then? And that's because the parents taught them to be right-handed for fear of them using their unclean hand for whatever. Okay, keep going. Okay. Since this is the ram for the ordination of Aaron and his sons, take the fat of the ram, including the fat of the broad tail, the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys and the fat around them, along with the right thigh. Then take one round loaf of bread, one thin cake mixed with olive, and one wafer from the basket of bread without yeast that was placed in the Lord's presence. Put all of these in the hands of Aaron and his sons to be lifted up as a special offering to the Lord. Afterward, take the various breads from their hands and burn them on the altar along with the burnt offering. It is a pleasing aroma to the Lord, a special gift for him. Then take the breast of Aaron's ordination ram and lift it up in the Lord's presence as a special offering to him. Then keep it as your own portion. Set aside the portions of the ordination ram that belong to Aaron and his sons. This includes the breast and the thigh that were lifted up before the Lord as a special offering. In the future, whenever the people of Israel lift up a peace offering, a portion of it must be set aside for Aaron and his descendants. This is their permanent right, and it is a sacred offering from the Israelites to the Lord. Amen. Aaron's sacred garments must be preserved for his descendants who succeed him, and they will wear them whenever they are anointed and ordained. The descendant who succeeds him as high priest will wear these clothes for seven days as he ministers in the tabernacle and the holy place. Take the ram used in the ordination ceremony and boil its meat in a sacred place. Then Aaron and his sons will eat this meat along with the bread in the basket at the tabernacle's entrance. They alone may eat the bread. Sorry, they, may, they alone may eat the meat and bread used for their purification in the ordination ceremony. No one else may eat them, for these things are set apart and holy. If any of the ordination meat or bread remains until the morning, it must be burnt. It may not be eaten, for it is holy. This is how you will ordain Aaron and his sons to, the of, to their offices, just as I have commanded you. The ordination ceremony will go on for seven days. Each day you must sacrifice a young bull as a sin offering to purify them, making them right with the Lord. Afterwards, cleanse the altar by purifying it. Make it holy by anointing it with oil. Purify the altar and consecrate it every day for seven days. After that, the altar will be absolutely holy, and whatever touches it will become holy. <laughs> These are the sacrifices you are to offer regularly on the altar. <laughs> Each day, offer two lambs that are a year old, one in the morning 
and the other in the evening. When one of them, with one of them, offered two quarts of choice flour mixed with one quart of pure oil of pressed olives, also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Offer the other lamb in the evening along with the same offerings of flour and wine as in the morning. It will be a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. These burnt offerings are to be made each day from generation to generation. Offer them in the Lord's presence at the tabernacle's entrance. There I will meet with you and speak with you. I will meet the people of Israel there, in the place made holy by my glorious presence. Yes, I will consecrate the tabernacle and the altar, and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will live among the people of Israel and be their God, and they will know that I am the Lord their God. I am the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I could live among them. I am the Lord their God. Okay, we'll stop for just a second. This word, uh, the tabernacle, <laughs> where <coughs> all of these things are taking place. It also, that word is also used as we will tabernacle with him, which means we are like the tabernacle if you look at us from Jesus' perspective. Once he comes into our heart, we become a clean vessel. I know that's hard to wrap your head around when you know your own thoughts, but the reality is we're clean. Jesus sees us as clean. Yes, Jesus has cleansed us. Just like all these offerings are cleansing these people, Jesus said, I am the final sacrificial lamb. See, this was to be taken. These, these sheep were supposed to be sacrificed every day. All of this is for consecration. So... It sounds like it. If you stop and think about it, this blood sacrifice is the way they splatter it on the different things and even on uh, and putting on the big toe and all that and even on their linen. They have to wash them every day. Yes. It is. It is. It's very, you know, uh, how many of you are a John MacArthur fan? Now, what I like about the guy is he is very good in his studies of this kind of stuff. Now, I don't agree with everything he says, just like people don't agree with everything I say. That's okay. But what I like is, he was having an interview one time with Ben Shapiro, and he says, basically, Aaron and his, brother, Aaron and his sons were just butchers. <laughs> and everything they wore was like an apron for a butcher. And when you see the amount of animals that they sacrifice... They are butchers. In the way that God tells them to dissect the body, that's butcher talk. Yeah. But inside of that, God must love to sit down with his people and eat. Amen. That's right. There's just something <laughs> about that. So. <laughs> yeah, different culture, different culture. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. Come on, it's not it's nasty. It's fixed. You have it's to have some Welsh lamb. Fixed. Okay, I want you to. Uh, I want you to go ahead and read down to verse ten of thirty. And then we'll stop. Okay. Exodus 30. Yes. Then make another altar of acacia wood for the burning incense. Make it 18 inches square and 36 inches high, with horns at the corners carved from the same piece of wood as the altar itself. Overlay the top, sides, and horns of the altar with pure gold, and run a gold molding around the entire altar. Make two gold rings and attach them on opposite sides of the altar below the gold molding to, carry, to hold the carrying poles. <laughs> Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Place the incense altar just outside the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant in front of the Ark's cover, the place of atonement that covers the tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. I will meet with you there. And every morning when Aaron maintains the lamps, he must burn fragrant incense on the altar. And each evening when he lights the lamps, he must again burn incense in the Lord's presence. 
This must be done from generation to generation. <laughs> Do not offer any unholy incense on this altar or any burnt offerings, grain offerings, or liquid offerings. And once a year, Aaron must purify the altar by smearing, it, by, by smearing its horns with blood from the offering made to purify the people from their sin. This will be a regular annual event from generation to generation, for this is the Lord's most holy altar. All right, we're going to stop right there as far as the reading goes. Now, one of the things <coughs> I wanted us to kind of flesh out tonight <coughs> with the things that we as individual individuals know about our Savior. <coughs> he is represented in everything we have read. He is the altar. He is the Ark of the Covenant. He is the seraphim, or the seraphim watch over him as he directs them. The um, menorah constantly shines light, just like Jesus constantly shines light on us. He is the S-O-N, and uh, I think it's interesting that somewhere down the line, we named the big ball of fire the S-U-N, but it's still the sun radiating light. And uh, one of the things, as I was listening to this a couple of times, I listened to this last night as I was praying, and I listened to it a couple of times, I went, this is what hit me. Look at the meticulousness that Aaron and his sons have to do everything just right or they die. Amen. And here in a couple of chapters, you actually see that two of his sons die because they burn the wrong incense. Yes, right. And so when you see that, you're like, look at, look at the meticulousness that you have to do to follow the law. Yeah. And then in comes Jesus roughly 1,600 years later after this. And he is just fluid in everything he does. He is just constantly fulfilling scriptures. And he's talking to this person. If the spirit hinders him from going there, he don't go there. If, he's, if God calls him to Samaria, even though nobody should go there, he goes to Samaria. He only does what the Father tells him to do. And you just see this fluidness. Of Jesus. You don't see him being a taskmaster the way these guys are having to do it. And as I kept listening to this, I thought, and we've inherited that. Do you do you know? Do you know? I can do stupid things every day, yet God's grace still covers it. He still sees me as righteous once I give my heart to him? Yeah. I, it, it's just ridiculous. And in that same fluidity that Jesus just travels for 33 years of this earth, uh, unknown to most people, and under the radar to the others, and then to the people of consequence, and he was a burr under their saddle, Right? Yet he loved them anyway and still made a way from them. In fact, one of my favorite hated scriptures in the Bible <laughs> is it says the chief priest and the leading elders were wagging their heads as they were walking in front of the cross. If you're really the son of God, why don't you come down off of there? And it's right after that that Jesus says, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. And when you, when you see that, you see this, and then you see that with Jesus. And we have inherited that through our salvation. I, you know, that's one reason why I say it's not the best way to share the gospel. But one of the ways to share it is through an apology. Right? Yeah, that's right. 
Sometimes we do stupid stuff, yeah. and then we have to apologize. That's right. And when we apologize, we become vulnerable. When we apologize in the name of the Lord, in other words, we bring the Lord into the conversation, all of a sudden that person's guard comes down. Yeah. All of a sudden now you have an in. That's right. And so that's one of the things that just stuck out to me. How these guys have to do everything. In, in uh, Hebrew, it says every dot or jot and tittle. Every time you see a jot or a tittle after one of their characters, when they, when they wrote the Old Testament and made copies and copies, you had to make sure every jot and tittle was in its place. That's right. But with Jesus, the words just flowed off. Greatest sermon ever preached. Looks like it was unpracticed and just on the side of a hill. And people, even people who don't follow Jesus say, he said some of the most profound things ever said in the history of the world. It just flowed off of him. So, why do we try to put ourselves under the law or under shame or under degradation upon ourselves? Why do we tell ourselves like you're stupid or you're dumb? Because our minds cannot totally comprehend but, and totally understand all the way. But we shouldn't do that. Right, I know. We shouldn't. We're actually cursing ourselves. We're making vows on ourselves. Don't do that. The King of kings and the Lord of lords has changed your mind and your heart. And the way that he lived on this earth is the same way that he can live in you every day. It is just crazy. So I wanted to leave you with that because every time I read the Bible through, every time I read a section of Scripture through over and over, every time I begin to listen to it over and over, even with somebody like Wayne reading tonight, and or if it had been somebody else, I'd have still heard it. And God is constantly speaking to us and honing us into the vessel He has called us to be from the moment of our inception. It is ridiculous when you get down to it. I know that was a lot of reading tonight, but I believe we're supposed to read the Word of God. And I don't like skipping over stuff, That's right. especially if it gets uncomfortable, right? For me, since uh, I have been dissecting animals a long time, and I don't mean that in a scientific way. I mean that as in processing animals a long time. I have a whole new respect for Aaron and his sons, a whole new respect. These guys were butchers on another level, and they had to follow the rules or die. Yet they did it. And even when Aaron's two sons in the next few chapters actually die, you don't see Aaron stop doing what he was called to do. It's just fascinating, fascinating. Uh, Aaron, here in a chapter and a half, Aaron is going to get a bad rap. And he deserves it. But you're also going to see the grace of God come right in on top of it. Because Aaron doesn't stop being Aaron the high priest. So let's stand and let's pray. So Father, in the holy name of Jesus, the name above all names, you know, Father, I just got this thought. Just like Jesus was talking to Nicodemus on the roof. And he said, can you tell where the wind comes or where it's going? No. Jesus, in some ways, was describing himself. And that's kind of what is captured in my mind. Thinking about all of these priestly garments. And all of the unique things that they represent 
or do. And Father, you, as you sent Jesus at just the right time, Jesus came in like a fresh wind. And he just cleansed that old covenant, put it to rest, used it as a foundation to build the new covenant in us. And then set us free and let us walk in this beautiful age of grace. Father, I thank you that Aaron and his sons are actually enjoying that level of grace now. I know it was hard for them. I can only imagine what it was for them to know all the responsibilities they had. Yet, Father, you were gracious. Clear down to putting the bells on their clothes so that everybody knew when they were going about their priestly business. Not to bring recognition to them, but to bring recognition to you. They were doing your work on behalf of the people. Father, what a picture of Jesus. Thank you for this time together tonight, and thank you for your word. Use us for your glory, and bless us any way you see fit as we bless others as we go throughout our days and weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for being here.